The Holy Gospel according to Mark, chapter 11. Glory to you, O Lord. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near the door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing, untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. Christ. Until 1954, the name of the sixth Sunday of Lent today was Palm Sunday. In 1955, the name became, for 15 years only, Second Sunday of the Passion or Palm Sunday. In 1970, it became Palm Sunday of the Passion of Our Lord. And somewhere between 1970 and 2021, the church stopped calling it Palm Sunday altogether at different times, depending on the denomination. The thinking behind this was that the Passion story of Jesus, that is, from the time of the Last Supper, through his arrest, trial, crucifixion, and burial, is more significant than how he entered into Jerusalem for the week that would lead to those events. And that fewer and fewer people were coming to church on Good Friday, which is when the story of Christ's passion is traditionally read. And so they decided to read the passion story today. We are not doing that today. Another reason that they began reading the Passion story on what we called Palm Sunday is it would be wrong to go from today's reading, a celebration of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, directly to Easter Sunday, skipping over the suffering part. So I predict this will be the last year that we isolate Palm Sunday as we ha have done today, at least at this church. But before we say goodbye to Palm Sunday, I want to clarify a few mysteries in the story, namely Jesus' mode of transportation, the donkey, his destination, the temple, and his unexplained prompt exit from the destination. Let's start with what we know. Jesus rides from the Mount of Olives down through the Kidron Valley and in through the city of Jerusalem's Eastern Gate. Eastern Gate. He's welcomed into Jerusalem like a triumphant king. People are waving palm branches and shouting, Hosanna! to this king who is riding on a donkey. Why on a donkey? This is done to fulfill 
the Messianic prophecy found in Zechariah 9.9. It says there, See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, humble, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. In this translation, the English word you heard was humble, which is probably influenced by the Greek praus, which means unassuming, considerate, or meek. But in the original Hebrew of Zechariah, the word used is ani, which literally means poor or afflicted. Poverty is a central theme of Jesus' ministry. As he routinely tells his disciples to get rid of their possessions, such as in Luke, when he says it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And so it makes sense that for his final week, poverty is part of the story. In fact, on Palm Sunday, he begins his procession from the house of Mary and Martha, which is located in a village on the backside of the Mount of Olives called Bethany, which is a name made of two Hebrew words, Be'et and Ani, which means poor. Be'et means house, house, poor house. So in the entire week leading up to Palm Sunday, Jesus is living in Bethany, which was a run-down suburb of Jerusalem. It's Passover week, peak tourist season, spring break. And Jesus cannot afford upscale accommodations inside the city where the wealthy pilgrims are staying. This humble procession intentionally depicts Jesus as a sort of anti-king anti-earthly king. The Messiah should not enter Jerusalem like an earthly king who enters with full of pomp and circumstance and riding on a stallion. At least not yet. See Revelation 19, 11. The people are shouting Hosanna or Hoshiana which in Hebrew literally means, please save. The authorities who were planning to arrest Jesus would later say the crowds wanted to be saved from Jesus. Jesus' disciples understood that, having heard of his miraculous healings, the crowds were shouting to be saved by Jesus. It would have been common in such a procession for this, for this king to ride from one temple to the next. But unlike in Matthew and Luke, when he also cleanses the temple, driving out the animals and the money changers with a whip, in Mark, he looks around and simply leaves. My question is, why? And the only thing I could come up with is maybe he needed to return the donkey. He said he would return it. Surely Jesus' word is good. What do we need to return at this point? What do we need to give back that we've borrowed? What do we need to let go? Maybe this year, when we fasted from our palms and we fasted from having a procession, we fasted from singing all glory, laud, and honor because something is lost in the translation when you sing a seven verse hymn without palms while sitting on your couch with a cup of coffee. When that happens, maybe we are being asked to think hard about the fast that Jesus would choose 
found in Isaiah 50, verse 8, which includes, break every yoke. Jesus rode on a donkey because he lived in solidarity with the poor. In modern day Christianity, we rarely factor this aspect into our celebration of Palm Sunday or any Sunday. We literally pay money for palms. Palms to wave until we enter the sanctuary, when we either put them down, play with them, poke our neighbors with them, or borrow one from a couple people so that we can braid them or form them into a cross, which helps us concentrate on the sermon while we're doing it. On the first Palm Sunday, as Jesus was entering Jerusalem, people waved palm branches because there were palm trees growing there. It was an easy way to join the celebration. It was part of the tradition when a king came to town. The Christian church has carried on the tradition of waving palms, but for many of us, getting those palms for our spring ritual involves faraway rainforests and international trade, a lot of international trade. Churches in the United States spend up to $4.5 million a year buying palms for Holy Week. Wow. Unfortunately, many of those palm purchases involve echo justice catastrophes. Under the conventional market systems, controlled by huge floral wholesalers, those branches are harvested in Mexico and Central America. A contract system with low-paid local workers bases compensation on the volume of palm branches that they cut. The economic incentive is to cut lots of branches, stripping trees beyond a sustainable level, and cutting low-quality branches so that almost half of them are discarded. It's wasteful, and it damages the rainforest. Sometimes the short-term workers are not treated well. When we're aware of the damage involved in their production, those are not the sort of branches that we really want to wave as a tribute to the Prince of Peace today. This link I'm making between parades, and processions, social commentary on the class system continues today, especially in the United States, where the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, and the black, brown, or Asian get shot. That pattern, too, has a long history. In 70 AD, in retaliation for the People's Rebellion, Rome destroyed the Jewish temple. Right before the temple was destroyed, there was one Jewish general who bravely tried to defend the temple valuables, but he was captured. Before the Romans burned down the temple, they went in and looted it for all the valuables. I believe the past year ha has given us an opportunity to consider what we do in the name of worship and what kind of witness we give to the world when we invest so much time and money and energy into things we do not need for the sake of feeling like we are honoring Jesus even though some of our practices leave many people out and some of our purchases conflict with Jesus' concern for the poor. And as we begin to talk about returning, I think we need to think about what is worth returning to and what is it time to leave behind. Religion in this country is perceived by many as a very real threat. 
And that should concern us, even if we are not intentionally participating in the ways it has been used to threaten or manipulate people. When religion is used to support hate and cruelty, then the state has looted the temple treasury for values. When religion is used to control women's bodies, to sanction violence against queer people, black indigenous people of color, anyone who is viewed as a threat. When Christians in Georgia speak of spiritual warfare and the need to maximize the Christian vote while voting to restrict the right to vote, equating Christian votes with white right-wing votes, making it illegal to bring those in line to vote a sip of water. Then the state has looted the temple treasury for valuables. After the valuables were stolen and the temple burned to the ground, a parade began from Jerusalem back to Rome, showing off the looted temple treasures. Then, right at the gates of Rome, they murdered the Jewish general. This was the bloody Roman triumphal procession. It was proudly memorialized in the Ark of Titus in Rome. This is part of the history of processions involving earthly kings. Originally, the processions were religious, but their form has survived for centuries metamorphosing from religious processions into royal entries, popular festivals, and since the beginning of the 20th century, commercial events like the American Parade. When you consider that something like the Thanksgiving Parade, a parade designed to entertain the wealthy and inspire Christmas shopping at the stores promoted in the parade through extravagant floats, when you consider that that was an offshoot of something that began as a religious procession, you could see why Jesus might have wanted to emphasize solidarity with the poor as a beginning point of his last full week on earth before the unprecedented events of Easter Sunday. So the question I invite you to ponder with me is how might the church be reformed into something in which our solidarity with the poor and our commitment to leaving no one out is unmistakable both in the way we live and in the way we worship. In Luke's telling of this story, the Pharisees go so far as to try to silence the crowds who are shouting Hosanna, which means save me. They tell him to make them stop. And Jesus' response to those who would silence the poor or try is the same answer he speaks to us still today. He said, even if these were silent, the stones would cry out. Shall be forsaken and yielded up to die. The 
sky shall groan and darken, and every stone shall cry, and every stone shall cry for stony hearts of Yeah.